Joseph, I mean, just to, to start, I mean, last time we, we met, remember we discussed operations and uh, in NATO as part of the new strategic concept. And I think then we both agreed, great minds think alike, yes, that Guess NATO so, yeah. inevitably was going to be pulled into operations, Afghanistan, Libya, because it has a command structure, experience, you know, the ability to generate forces. Um, but the one thing I want to talk to you about tonight is not so self-evident, frankly. It, it's this idea that was in the strategic concept of NATO uh, addressing sort of new security challenges. Uh, you saw all that, huh? the yeah, emphasis yeah. on cyber defense, yeah. on terrorism, proliferation, uh, even energy security. Uh, well, what do you think? I mean, do you think that NATO really has a role in an area like cyber? Or is it just, you know, jumping on the bandwagon thinking that, well, if, you know, if this is a big topic, NATO should be doing something, whether it really mm. provides added value or not. So what, what's your take on, 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 on cyber? You know, I'm, still, I'm still thinking about it. I'm not so sure. Um, because that has to do with the, with the specifics of what cyber attacks or cyber security means. You know? Because we, you have on the one hand, you have uh, cyber attacks against uh, businesses, um, enterprises, uh, databases that basically store data of people. That's not really a hard security challenge. Yeah. On the other hand, you have societies that are extremely dependent on the flow of communications in running our power plants, in running our daily affairs, in managing uh, train schedules, and just everything. Yeah. So, you know, in, in a way, this is a vast area for paralyzing a society. Absolutely. Uh, that can have grave military implications. Yeah. At the same time, it has civil sense, In which sense, though, would you say grave military implications? The way you're describing it, it really seems like more of a private sector activity, yes? Banks, obviously, hire computer specialists to protect banks. So railways hire yeah. computer specialists to protect their sort of ticketing yeah. or, or operations or whatever. So uh, if most of cyberspace is owned by the private sector, shouldn't it really be protected by the private sector? Is there really a, a sort of a role there for the military or for governments? Well, I think in... in uh, at first look, uh, it actually should. Uh, on second look, uh, when you look at the way in which military operations or the whole operation of, of military security in uh, a society now interacts with the civil uh, dimensions, um, whenever it comes to logistics, whenever it comes to moving people, uh, to moving staff, this is not a, a totally separated world. You know, you would believe that, that military institutions have extra security uh, also for, for everything digital. But we have seen, we have seen hackers uh, entering the Pentagon. Uh -huh, no, yeah. We have seen uh, uh, things being done uh, to uh, uh, installations, even if it be business installations in other countries that had also a, a possible dual use capability. So I think the, the, the boundaries are somewhat fluid. And yeah. so it, it's, it's not very easy to say, well, here this is, this is to be done by business. This is to be done by the private sector or by civil administration. Yeah, and but, this is purely when you look at this, I mean, most of it looks to be sort of espionage. You know, people try to steal yeah. data, which they could use, obviously, for classical spying or to gain a commercial advantage like company secrets. Uh, about 90% of it, according to my understanding, is essentially information. So what why are sort of people talking this up in, in terms of cyber Geddon, cyber Pearl Harbor, cyber warfare, as if this is really, you know, after sort of aircraft or after tanks, after nuclear weapons, the new sort of supreme yeah. instrument of war? Do you not think all of this is a little bit sort of exaggerated or the cyber threat is overhyped? Well, if you had real investments behind such an attack, if you had, for example, uh, major states uh, planning it, uh, doing it, you might as well find yourself uh, in a time of an operation blinded because you don't all of a sudden you ha don't have intelligence. All of a sudden you may have your air traffic control being disturbed or uh, providing uh, the wrong kind of information. You may have even uh, uh, satellite signals being distorted so that actually all your actions based on GPS services, which is yeah. Numerous in military affairs yeah, everybody today. Everybody uses space these yeah. days, huh? For communicate, so, you can't run a NATO military yeah. operation. If you, without if you space, don't yeah. have your yeah. kind of nerd yeah. type of hacker yeah. sitting somewhere in a college room trying to get into the Pentagon database, but have a a military operation behind it, um, there might be things that could effectively put 
uh, military operations of, of NATO, for that matter, to, to stand still? Well, I certainly agree with you about that. Uh, we at NATO have said publicly that we have over 100 sort of cyber attacks a day on our vital communication systems. We, we have nearly 30 of these important communication systems. And it's true that you know, the more we uh, do operations, the more we plug in partners, the more we work with other international organizations. So the number of people who need to, uh, need to have access to your system to function, that number keeps growing all the time. So it, it's, it's certainly becoming a, a headache. But, but you know, what should we do about it? Should our role simply be better protection uh, try to make it harder for people to hack into our systems? Or are we now starting to think in classical conflict terms of things like retaliation, uh, deterrence? Uh, I mean, do you think the wars of the future will be entirely won or lost in, in, in cyberspace before you know, the kinetic element has, yeah. has had an opportunity to engage? Well, I would certainly think that, that uh, um, as we have now intelligence and counterintelligence, we will have uh, cyber attacks and counter uh, attacks. Now, if there is or are actors that might be able to blind you, you might want to uh, communicate to them that uh, you are able to do the same to them if they consider that. So it might actually factor into some kind of classic uh, retaliation or deterrence strategy uh, at one point. Yeah. Now, but this will probably be limited and have to be limited uh, to those types of operations where you can uh, clearly make the case for a military significance uh, in the more immediate sense. So you think there's going to be some sort of threshold there uh, which would distinguish between cyber as inconvenience, I don't yeah. like it, yeah. but it doesn't really undermine my society. Uh, I can recover in a few days, like Estonia recovered in 2007 uh, against the uh, attacks then. Uh, and, but a threshold above which you then start considering that it has the same impact as a declaration of war, really, uh, yeah. a, a hostile intent. In right. right. That's difficult, though, right, yeah. in order to yeah. know exactly where that yeah. threshold could be. I would like to hear your view on that. I would believe that uh, this is also a case for uh, a smart way of intelligence sharing. I would believe that given this kind of residual f threat that may exist, that, that military intelligence units would have an interest in making available at least some of the data, some of the, the knowledge that they have acquired about the ways in which hacking uh, agencies or actors operate, what they could do, what the latest uh, twist in technology is, uh, also to, to the business community, to uh, uh, the public sector uh, or, or uh, institutions in the private sector that have to do with data or critical infrastructure. But that would not necessarily mean that we will uh, see a militarization of things. So I would, I would expect NATO to, to, to make an effort to draw that line itself in order to keep the military side to what is the military. Well, I, yeah, you're right, of course, but you've got to remember, Joseph, that in the cyber area, there's some sort of in extremely tough intellectual problems uh, to grapple with that don't really exist in other areas of, of, of conflict or military activity. I mean, for example, if, if you take uh, attribution, you remember with somebody fires a nuclear weapon or a, a missile, you know where it's come from. Uh, uh, it's a state. There's a state responsibility. So a deterrence works because you know who you'd be retaliating against. I mean, I think the real problem problem that we're facing in cyber is this problem of attribution. Uh, even if you suspect uh, uh, the origin, the, the source of the attack, it's almost impossible to prove it in a kind of call to law, a call to public opinion. So cyber is the ultimate asymmetric weapon. It yeah. costs virtually nothing to get into the business. You just need a computer and, and, and a modem and a certain degree of know-how. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it takes uh, an enormous uh, establishment, on the other hand, with a, to try to uh, protect your systems against that hacking across the board and to do forensics to really yeah. know where it's come from. So I, I think that's the first problem. The second major uh, issue that, that I see in the cyber world is that if you look at other aspects of NATO, uh, all NATO territory has equal cover. You know, for example, a missile defense system, when that's built in Europe, protects all NATO Europe against missile attacks. Or NATO's Article 5 in the conventional area protects all of NATO territory. So everybody's got a kind of equal insurance policy. The trouble is with cyber, it is the, the protection is very uneven because it can attack anything. You, you said it, you know, a banking system, a military communications network, a SCADA, a power 
our grid. And some NATO countries have a high degree of protection and some have far less. So yeah. we are much more exposed uh, because there are many more cyber targets and because our allies haven't yet sort of come up with a notion of what is a kind of minimum standard well, for everybody. I there, that, I think, is the, yeah, the real problem. There you've got a real issue. Yeah. The asymmetries among the capabilities of NATO members. Um, uh, because, you know, that might be a real security challenge also to NATO, that uh, uh, attacked on the weakest spot, uh, you still be able to, in a certain way, uh, do harm uh, on the system, or in, in a way to, to undermine this equal insurance policy that you just described for NATO. So basically, <clears throat> there would be a case for NATO, uh, but when you look at, when you look at, at those, those hacking nerds, I think that's not a case for military alliance, isn't it? That's probably better dealt with with uh, some you know, hardening your defenses or uh, upgrading your yeah. protection. The problem is, is that you know military strategy is, as you know, as a strategy, is always relied upon the fact that you don't only take the pressure. Uh, you know, it's like a football team. If you have a football team that only defends. The, uh, then sooner or later it's going to lose a game because sooner or later the defence will crack, somebody will find a way in. So the only way you can win a football match is to defend but go and score goals at the other end. And I have an intellectual problem with this notion that the only thing you could do would be to try to make it harder for an attacker because if, an, if you're just defending and the attacker is free, completely free, yeah. to find any form of attack, then uh, uh, basically, as I said, uh, you are at the disadvantage. So we've got to have some way of, of holding attackers accountable. But yes. the problem is, and this is where I'd welcome your view, is how do we hold the attackers accountable? Uh, economic sanctions? Do you, I mean, for example, do you think there could be an arms control regime in, in cyberspace like we have in the nuclear area that could rule out certain systems? You know, uh, rule out certain yeah. forms of, of, of behaviour? I mean, is that at all feasible or is that uh, an illusion? Well, if that comes, I think that that will be some way down the line, you know, uh, because first of all, um, uh, I think everyone needs to realize that probably what we could do to others, they, if not now, but at some point, will be able to do to us. Yeah. And if, if we think that what we could do could really be uh, causing harm, mm -hmm. then probably they could do the same too. So, you know, once you're at that point where you realize that, that a couple of actors, and I mean you're speaking mostly of state actors, have that kind of ability, then basically you're approaching the grounds to say, well, how to, how to go about this? If we can't deny them uh, this kind of capability, we might as well have an interest in, in finding a way to uh, uh, reassuring ourselves mutually uh, what we do and what we don't do. So you're talking about sort of confidence building <coughs> yeah, measures. Yeah, there could be. A, maybe not limitations yeah. on computers, like we have limitations on tanks or yeah. aircraft, but some... Well, well some, some form of verification regime associated to it that you actually share some of your capabilities and let the other side know that you'd be able to do this. Ah, uh, that's uh, interesting. And you might be able also uh, uh, to, to sh develop a common viewpoint on, say, given this kind of difficulty, of accountability that you described, um, why not have the major players then have a form of a system that they keep informing each other so that you at least know it doesn't come from them. It must come from, from a third party outside. And, and it's in the interest of, of both A and B uh, to reassure themselves that it's not them and maybe find together who C is. So it wouldn't be some kind of United Nations international agreement in the first place uh, encompassing all states. I don't you're really looking, see that. You're looking more at sort yeah. of bilateral things in, cer yeah. in certain countries that have cyber capabilities forming bilateral agreements in I would in, I would in, believe in, in that, that uh, before, uh, they, uh, before uh, actors, state actors would be ready to share it with the world yeah. Uh, they might want to share but, it with, yeah. with the most significant other. The you know. trouble is, though, again, would states really be prepared to cooperate? Would they have an interest? Because, you know, cyber has certain enormous advantages from the point of view of a military operator. Uh, as I say, you're anonymous, uh, so you can't, 
declare it as a casus belli and then escalate, that's very difficult. Often you don't want to admit you're attacked because you're frightened to admit that you, you're, you're, you're vulnerable, so you hush the thing up. But the other thing, I mean, look at that Stuxnet. You remember yeah. all of the publicity yeah. where you had a, 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 a malware which was infiltrated into an Iranian nuclear power plant run by the, the, uh, the Siemens uh, yeah. operating software. It was able not only to penetrate uh, centrifuges, but actually destroy them. So it went from the virtual world to the physical world yeah. and was able to, I, I understand, you know, just on newspaper reports, destroy about 1,000 uh, Iranian centrifuges. Aren't states so tempted to sort of see that as, a, uh, as an alternative to conflict, as a secret but effective way of gaining their political objectives, uh, stopping uh, a program on the other side they don't like? It is, so, you know, again, the, the temptation to use this will be greater than the temptation yeah. to control it, isn't exactly. that really? Well, yeah, that's yeah. A, I don't see that uh, any state in, in the modern world who has these capabilities would want to give them away. No, but uh, uh, once you find yourself in a situation where you're not the only one uh, to have this, it's like in arms control when uh, uh, the West, when the United States had MIRV technology, yeah. uh, had cruise missiles. And so the Soviets only, didn't. Only, only, only procured a temporary advantage, though, yeah. you're right. Yeah, yeah. But, so you know, eventually they had to come to arms control in, these, in order yeah. to deal with it. Yeah. In the negotiations, yeah. the American pattern uh, in, in, in arms reduction and arms control has been to say, well, our latest advances we protect. For the time being, we leave them out. But once it was realized that the other side had that technology as well, then all of a sudden you grow an interest in tying that into some form of, of arms control regime with some form of, of confidence building, some form of verification built into that. Do you think that's a role for NATO to work on these kind of arms control norms uh, or should the NATO role be more in, in terms of the physical protection of the NATO systems, for example, and providing yeah. assistance to NATO member states that could be attacked? So, I mean, you know, how ambitious should we, we try to be in this area? Well, I think there is a role in NATO specifically as long and as far as these asymmetries among member states uh, continue to exist because then this is an effective uh, tool for member states to make them more secure. Beyond that, I don't, I don't uh, now see NATO as, as being you know, the center of operations of global uh, cyber uh, strategy or cyber warfare. Yeah. That, I believe, will be very much a national affair, but NATO will be called in as the place where where you can actually then bridge gaps, uh, where you can bring people up to a certain level because it affects the security of the alliance at I, large. I think there are certain things that NATO can do. I, I, you're right. For example, uh, it's, it's clear that uh, one of the things we need is to talk to the private sector uh, and to the civilian areas. It strikes me on cyber that whereas you know, often NATO does its business directly with foreign ministries and defence ministries, for example, operations, yeah. we were talking about that last time, there's a clear lever, there's a command structure that you can activate when you've taken a decision. On cyber, it's not defence ministries or foreign ministries in the lead. It's often the interior ministries, yeah. it's the, yeah. the police, intelligence yeah. services. I mean, I was struck, we, we, <laughs> you'll find this interesting, Joseph, we had a NATO meeting a couple of weeks ago on, on cyber, where we asked the nations to send us their cyber czars, you know, the, the people who were in charge of national coordination. About 80% of them had never been to NATO in their lives yes. before. It was a completely different group of people in the nation. So to my mind, one of the challenges that we're going to face is to connect ourselves to the civilian side and have a civilian implementation yes. Yes. mechanism like we have on the military side to, to deal with yeah. it. I think another thing, though, is that countries clearly are, are looking for common standards protocols of protection they're looking to exchange yeah. lessons learned yeah. every week you open a newspaper you read of a cyber yeah. attack and I think yeah, clearly there is a role for NATO I think you, you, you mentioned it in I exchanging think, best practice yeah, that's and, that's where yeah. the role is uh, I would would feel rather uncomfortable if you know this this difficulty to draw clear boundaries then led to a fact that everything is military now, it, I don't think it's good for the military to, to move so far beyond its core business. And I don't think it, it, is, it is very suitable for the kind of digital environment that uh, we're about to build, which has a lot to do with uh, being fairly open, fairly accessible. You know, and if you, if you apply the military logic to that, you don't want this.
you start yeah. having a sort of an internet which is divided up into yeah. all kinds of segregated systems with secret access and so on. And, I think we'd lose the benefit of the internet right, that right. way. Right, that's, so, what, so that's so what I think, you know, yeah. with all of the difficulties that, that this entails. You know, if you, if you look to a specific group of actors, uh, I think uh, the issue becomes a bit more uh, uh, complicated or even more dangerous. Uh, we've been talking about those hackers. We've been talking about uh, also state actors. But you, you briefly mentioned terrorists before. If you want to create terror in a society, you don't need to attack military installations. You're not going after the communications between airplanes and, their, and the base. You're going for civil infrastructure. And you're going for creating damage that you can announce beforehand. Yeah. Because that's what creates panic. And yeah. that's what terrorists are after. So basically, in this kind of asymmetric struggle that we're seeing between international terrorism, yeah in uh, modern security institutions, yeah. we see them not attacking the military component of our infrastructure, but specifically the civilian No, I, I agree. Civili uh, terrorists ultimately yeah. want to attack yeah. civilian people yeah. and civilian targets. And that's where, so that's where, where we get into the complicated situation. That's the shock yeah. value, of yeah. course, that innocent where, people are where affected. Where we have a, that's why a we're military affected, machinery, yeah. Yeah. but they're not attacking it. They're right. attacking but, the civilian but side But one, one area where perhaps I don't totally uh, share that view initially, I agree with you that in principle uh, cyber would seem to be a, a wonderful arm of the terrorists because, you know, like suicide yeah. bombing, it's cheap, uh, it has a high asymmetric uh, effect, uh, you don't need a large organisation and therefore a big footprint. But the one thing is, is that, as you know, terrorists rely enormously on the internet. You know, Al-Qaeda is now depleted in Afghanistan, it's a shadow of its former self, even if it's still in business. So the one w way that they now uh, proselytise, organise, is to communicate by the internet, you know, radicalisation, training, uh, you know, the self-radicalised yeah. Uh, militant who never goes to uh, a training camp. So don't they really need the internet and, and therefore yeah. Yeah. they probably don't want to fight a war in the internet because if the internet isn't the open system that you were just talking about, they would be the first people to lose, would they not? In terms of no, sure. no longer being able to sure. carry out their radicalization but, programs. But for, for the reasons that we discussed, the internet will, will remain such a very uh, open, very uh, plural space uh, will have all kinds of new means of new uh, technologies, new modes of interaction, um, that there will be plenty of ways in, in using the internet for uh, the organization of terrorist activities. But I'm pretty sure that terrorists will also continue to, to use the internet uh, to uh, carry out their missions. For example, uh, you block all of the sudden yeah. Uh, the electricity for a major city. Yeah. Okay. Hospitals have backup and, yeah. and all that, but not everyone has backup. Yeah. And a but few people will die. No, I, I, I take this point, and I can see uh, that weapons of mass disruption uh, are useful to terrorists. But I still believe that ultimately, what is spectacular for for terrorists in terms of showing that they're there. Uh, is the actual physical destruction of property yeah. or people, yeah. killing people. And what the problem I have a little bit with this, or with cyber, is, is that yes, it sort of you know, stops things. You can't access your bank account. Yeah. Your identity is stolen. The traffic lights go out. And I agree that certain people could be killed, but you know, most of the evidence, even from massive cyber attacks like we've seen against Estonia, against Georgia, the French Ministry of Finance the other day, the European External Action Service, is that you know, nobody gets harmed. Uh, the, yeah. the effect is uh, for a few days. Then somebody comes up with a patch, uh, uh, reroutes the system. So if you're a terrorist and you really want a spectacular night 9-11, you want to blow something you, you up. You want to blow something up. You, you, yeah. you want to kill, kill people. That makes me yeah. just slightly skeptical. But on the other yeah. hand... But if uh, you could crash a train... Yep. You know, make you know, a plane it, yeah. sort of go off course. Yeah. And the pilot not having control over it. You know, I, I, I think that it sounds a bit like science fiction. Yeah. But probably the degree to which we depend on the functioning of these systems is at the same time uh, our greatest vulnerability. Yeah. Because we're, no. we're actually we're relying on, on, on the fact that things work the way that they are designed to work. Yeah, no, I, I can see the point there because uh, I, I remember a, a couple of years ago, uh, Al-Qaeda Iraq, when it was still uh, a going concern, apparently spent $26 
$26 downloading a technology from the internet that enabled uh, this movement to actually have access to the pictures being taken by American drones in, in, in the sky. And, and that intelligence information about the operations of a military force obviously could be used by terrorists to plan attack. So, so no, I, I, I agree. I can't see terrorists steering clear of, the, uh, yeah. of, of cyber. But, but Joseph, you know, we're, we're sort of 10 years on from 9-11. Uh, in September, we're going to mark the anniversary. Yeah. Uh, you remember George W. Bush sort of described it as the global war on terrorism and that terrorism was going to be the paradigm of the 21st century. I mean, you know, if you were going to write an article for a, a newspaper or, or for your uh, think tank or, on September the 11th uh, this year, looking back at, at the 10 years, um, how do you think, you know, the international community has fared? Have we done a good job fighting terrorism, a bad job? Uh, have we done things right, we've done things wrong. What would be your sort of balance sheet of, of where we are uh, in the, I won't say the, yeah. the global war yeah. on terror, I think that term doesn't quite have the resonance it one ha once had, but at least in terms of uh, dealing, dealing with it. And again, you know, like I asked you on cyber, did we overhype the, uh, the terrorist threat vis-a-vis -vis other issues like proliferation or energy or pandemics that maybe didn't get enough attention as a result? In a way, I think we did. And it's probably, it's very hard to avoid that if you have an incident like uh, September 11 and uh, thousands of people being killed on a day in a, an extremely visible spot. I think it's very hard to say, uh, to expect actors to say, let's keep things in proportion. You know, there is still proliferation. Uh, I think basically the international community and NATO has done fairly well on A, making the problem understood, on B, acting especially on those cases where you had these sort of safe havens uh, for terrorist groups. And as, as, as much as Afghanistan was that, I think there was pretty much a crackdown on the uh, ability of terrorist groups to group, uh, assemble, plan, uh, expand in Afghanistan. But it, it hasn't been eradicated because also this is, uh, in military terms, so asymmetric uh, it's uh, it's like uh, uh, fighting uh, this kind of 17th century uh, traditional battles where you would all line up on one side and the other side simply wouldn't do it. Yeah, do you, do you think, though, uh, looking at NATO's operations like Afghanistan, which is often linked publicly to the fight against terrorism, the idea that that's where the threats on 9-11 originated from, but do you, do you think that sort of military operations beyond your territory like Afghanistan uh, are the right way to deal with terrorism uh, because it takes off, as you say. It leaves Afghanistan, it goes elsewhere, yeah. it reconstitutes. It's like you know what the Americans call whack-a-mole. You, you whack the mole there and it yeah. pops up somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. I mean, I've heard some people say around Brussels that the only strategy is really try to defend your homeland, your territory, uh, and not go to places like Afghanistan to defeat terrorism. So has NATO really been investing its assets in the wisest way by fighting terrorism in a place like Afghanistan? Well, Afghanistan still, according to General Petraeus, does have some core of Al-Qaeda activists still existing. They may not be in Afghanistan all the time, but obviously they have the ability to return uh, every once in a while. So I think that the, the, the lesson out of that is you can affect a country where you have a government that actually is, uh, is issuing open invitations. That NATO has shown it has the ability to stop this to stop that government, to replace that government, and to really crack down on terrorist activities in that country. But what is not a generally military challenge is to address kind of the, the milieu in which uh, terrorism grows. Uh, and that milieu we see existent in Pakistan, and with all the contacts that the West has with Pakistan, we have not been really able uh, to affect the situation on the ground which is not the capital, but it's the provinces, it's the villages, it's out in the country um, to be resilient to this kind of inflow. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, maybe one of our uh, major hopes is that with this kind of Arab Spring that we're seeing, mm -hmm. also the, the milieu for terrorists in the Arab world or in the Muslim world will change after all. You know, with, with, with better governance, with less feeling of estrangement uh, yeah. of the people, with a a higher conviction that it's actually them, yeah. that it's determining their fate, yeah. they may be less inclined to believe 
uh, what terrorists are telling them, that it's all the well, I, I just fault. I just hope you're right. I just hope you're right. But revolutions often have, as you know, two phases, yeah. uh, an initial yeah. phase, which is often carried out by by people who want sort of secular improvements to their lives and then frustrated uh, expectations not being met and a more radical uh, uh, phase, a power vacuum, the moderates are eliminated and then the extremists take over. And certainly if those Arab Spring uh, revolts, call them what you like, go wrong, then I imagine there'd be fertile ground for Al-Qaeda yeah. in that area. And, and that's, 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 that's the scenario where we have to try to resist. That's a, that's a process, for example, where it's very hard for a military alliance to actually affect yeah. uh, outcomes, because this is social, it's cultural, it's economic, it has to do with the beliefs of people, um, and uh, it is not the kind of nail to which NATO has the hammer. No, I agree. I, I think in terrorism uh, we've uh, had a, a, a difficult time uh, defining what is our niche area uh, since 9-11, and certain things which we tried to do, uh, for example, like the control of airspace against hijacked aircraft proved to be difficult because of the legal situation yeah. and what you can do and what you can't do. Yeah. Um, I, I think maybe one of the best things we've done, although we don't get much publicity for it, is to try to work with allies to develop technologies uh, against explosive uh, yeah. devices, yeah. for example, to protect aircraft, yeah. uh, protect ports and, and harbors, you know, which obviously in terms of protecting uh, people, mass transportation systems could be helpful, but well, which uh, is which is what you labeled under protecting the homeland. Yes, in, in a way, isn't it's, it? It's a kind of protecting the the, the, the homeland. But, yeah. but I still think that you know, given that terrorism is going to be with us for some time to come, yes. and you spoke about the Arab Springs, that one thing we really need to look into once the the dust settles in that part of the world. Uh, non, ça va, merci. Uh, on a tout ce qu'il faut. Is, 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 you know, what could NATO do to help those countries afterwards uh, build up their security uh, forces? You know, look at Libya. It, it's got militias, mercenaries, yeah. uh, tribes, but there's no national army uh, worth uh, speaking about. Uh, the army, of course, exists elsewhere. It's even in Egypt played a, a role in the transition. But there must be quite a lot of work that NATO could do to help these countries uh, form security structures. Uh, including units to deal with terrorism that, that obviously could, could help them keep elements like Al-Qaeda at bay. I mean, do you, do you think that you know, we might have more opportunities uh, in that regard in the future? I think so, but it depends a lot on the willingness of these countries to actually allow for that. When you look at uh, what NATO had did uh, after 1989, uh, before actually the enlargement of NATO, uh, and what NATO does today uh, further to the east, I think there is a, a transfer of knowledge. There is a kind of a transfer of a security culture. Uh, also through uh, those training programs, those visiting programs, that you actually have uh, people from the military infrastructure of a number of partner countries today uh, taking part in the way in which NATO deals about security. That is transferring a lot of information to them. And of course, you, you, you have uh, a technical assistance. Uh, you have uh, assistance in building up effective uh, mechanisms. And I would believe in the future. Uh, what we learn nowadays in terms of how do we link external security done by the national military infrastructure and by NATO with domestic security institutions. Some, you know, how to link these two worlds that have been uh, uh, have not seen eye to eye uh, for a very long time. This will be an experience uh, that is also ready for export then. Well, I certainly think that you know, one of NATO's future roles uh, coming out of operations, tying into what we said last time, is going to be this idea of training uh, security sector reform. Uh, if you're leaving Afghanistan or if you're leaving Kosovo or Bosnia, you can't leave a vacuum behind. Yeah. We, uh, you've got to leave uh, adequately trained, multi-ethnic in many cases, local forces, including the police, not just because uh, the police often have more of a role in dealing with terrorism domestically, you right. said, than right. the, the army, uh, that can stand on their own feet, or maybe you know, with some ongoing mentoring, but can stand on their own feet. Uh, two uh, feet uh, and, and deal with these uh, issues. So my sense is that that's going to be a permanent task for NATO and yes. instead of improvising a training mission every time we have an operation, well, you know, which is very difficult in terms of generating the trainers, very difficult to find, particularly on the police side, we, we need some kind of standing organisation which could look at that on a, on a, on a full-time basis. But, but one other thing, I mean, 
coming back to 9-11, I mean, it, 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 Osama bin Laden, if he's still alive or, or, or on the 10th anniversary, I often wonder, you know, when he looks at his own situation, whether, you know, his view of his situation will be as negative as we would hope it would be. I mean, he could probably, you know, say to himself, well, I'm still here. Yeah. You know, Al-Qaeda is still in business. I've still been able to carry out a lot of attacks, even if they failed. Even the failures have been successful because, you know, they've created a big demand for protection on the side of my enemies. I've inspired, you know, lots of movements elsewhere, the, the franchise movements. Uh, I've got the internet. A lot of people are using that to radicalise themselves. You know, even survival is a kind of uh, success. So do you, do you think that this sort of problem of Al-Qaeda is going to be as big for this coming decade as it was in the, in the last decade? Or do you think in a way that, you know, through learning our lessons, we've not eradicated the problem. You can't eradicate terrorism. Yeah any more than you can eradicate yeah. the flu. But at least it, it, it's more containable now than it was uh, 10 years ago. I think we've got a much better understanding nowadays than we had 10 years ago. Uh, at the same time, over these 10 years, the ability of uh, individuals to form groups, uh, to build organizations with <clears throat> very little um, preconditions has grown as well. So basically, uh, Bin Laden could say today, in the kind of environment I live today, it is actually easier for me to run my operations than it has been. It may be more difficult for me to do the kind of uh, uh, damage that I was able uh, to, to set up and organize uh, at the beginning of the decade, but uh, my, my basic environment uh, is still there. And, and I think uh, you would also say the recognition uh, on the part of my adversaries is uh, that their means are somewhat limited. So I would believe that uh, his balance sheet is not uh, all that bad. And for our side, I think we need to be sober on this. I think, we, yeah, I think uh, their perception of the world is probably different from ours in the way yeah. that they, they measure it. I think that probably Bin Laden sees that the mere fact he survived is a kind of judgment of God, as he would see it, yeah. that he still yeah. uh, is carrying out a righteous... Uh, uh, campaign. But what worries me a little bit is we went to Afghanistan, as you know, after 9-11 uh, in response to the attacks. Uh, everybody knew for many years that Afghanistan was being used by Al-Qaeda as training bases and so on, uh, but nothing was done about it. It was only once the attacks had taken place. So we re re reacted. And it seems to me now that if you look around the globe, uh, in, in Yemen, in, in West Africa, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Somalia, you know, more and more indications that these same networks yeah. Yeah. are being created. Well, you know, are we going to make the same mistake again of doing nothing about these places before an attack happens and then provides a mandate? Or, or you know, should NATO now be much more in the business of trying you know, not only to deal with this crisis, but anticipate where yeah. the next crisis is going to come from? Not wait for the worst to happen as a kind of organisation of last resort, but start you know, trying to take now policies which would... Uh, uh, deal with that that issue, like terrorist training camps. Uh, yeah. But this, 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 this concerns me a yeah. little bit. This it's, kind of reactive yeah. sort of nature, you know, particularly when we talk in the strategic concept, Joseph. You remember yeah. of using NATO more politically yeah. as a forum for for consultations, and of course the financial crisis. Everybody's talking about you know we can't afford these expensive reactions, so we've got to be yeah. you know more uh, uh, astute and agile in terms of prevention. Seems to me that's very hard. Um, if you focus uh, primarily on the military uh, instruments in that. I think a lot of that speaks for uh, being politically more sensitive and politically more alert. Then you can also, you, know, you can try to build those kind of relationships that would allow you also to transfer uh, know-how, to transfer uh, messages, information uh, on actually the, the kind of, of threat that is there or that is building up in a particular region and country. Um, I think we find it generally hard uh, in, in an environment where fragility also grows with interdependence, where we have a number of states, uh, um, probably also in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, uh, where uh, uh, statehood is weak uh, and may get weaker. 
uh, where we have uh, tribal uh, conflicts, we have uh, ethnic issues, we have failed socioeconomic developments. So we have, we have ingredients that could be uh, building ground. Yeah. Now you can, you can upgrade your efforts on the development assistance side or on, on helping uh, improve governance. Uh, it will give you no guarantee. Yeah. You know? But uh, I think the difficulty for NATO will always remain that uh, when people look towards NATO, it's already a bit late. But this worries me too a little bit. The, I mentioned this, and the other thing, of course, and we spoke about cyber, where which is such a massive problem. The, the number of countries, the number of social actors, organised criminal networks, uh, yeah. the hacker in the garage, states, yeah. military establishments, the enormous difficulty of getting to grips with these kind of, uh, of problems. Uh, you need to build massive coalitions now, don't you? I mean, when I first arrived at NATO many years ago, we basically could tackle the problems with our own membership. Yeah. Partners were yeah. useful. Yeah. But desirable, but 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 not essential. You know, we we were. An, you remember the British poet John Donne about a man being an island unto himself. Yeah. But nowadays, you know, on terrorism or cyber, and you've described very well just how multifaceted these problems are. You need to build not only with states but organisations like the EU, the UN, these enormous sort of coalitions so that you can address all of the f aspects uh, simultaneously. And I I just wonder in NATO whether. Uh, we're going to be able to build those kind of coalitions to keep pace with threats which are rapidly uh, e evolving. I mean, I'm struck, for example, on cyber, just the fact that how you know, organised criminal elements can get together with states, for example, or uh, cyber hackers are drawn into organised criminal networks. So these, these problems have a way of coalescing extremely yeah. easily, but our responses seem to be very slow and beset with all kinds of bureaucratic and political obstacles. Also, you know, it's, it's as much as one from a pure security point of view would wish that we got everything under control. I think in terms of the quality of, of uh, our societies and, and the kind of life that we want to have, we would not want to do this. So I think it actually takes a very wise approach is to say, what's the minimum that we have to do in order to uh, protect us from these security threats and not at the same time kind of militarize a lot of our uh, civic in infrastructure which after all we enjoy uh, of being civil of being not following yeah. a military and security first logic. Yeah. Huh? So this is a, a sort of you know traditional conflicts provided security like warfare yeah. but at the price of enormous social mobilization. You knew when you were at war life changed. Yeah. Now we're dealing yeah. with new threats where we're in a kind of conflict and we need to deal with it but without mobilizing all of our societies and I think it, it, suppressing freedoms or having censorship yep. like we had in wars so societies function joseph i think this is enough for me to think about quite frankly for one evening <laughs> you've given me a lot of food for for, for thought well, and can we, give back compliment to back to you okay let, let's continue the next time we meet. all right we will all the best thanks a lot thanks to you too cheers cheers They, they are trying to deter us, do you think, uh, as much as we worry about how we can deter them. There's this kind of uh, reverse psychology. For alliances such as NATO, this is an extremely important issue. But do you think that, for example, a NATO missile shield uh, in Europe means that then we don't need, for example, to have nuclear weapons anymore? You know, is is the, the, the NATO-Russia relationship good enough to to do it as a joint project. Why can't that same sort of system of nuclear deterrence work between other potentially uh, conflicting parties? What can NATO do in order to, to get a similar development going on the Russian side?